Would you like some cheese on that hamburger? <laughs> hey, we are in the last of our message on If Money Talked. And I want to invite you to grab your Bible or turn on your digital device and join me in Matthew chapter 6. We're just looking at the words of Jesus. Jesus wants us to experience life at its, at its best. And there's a tension. Many of us, right, we trust Jesus for life at its best when it comes to the spiritual But when it comes to the financial, sometimes we're just a little bit slower. We're not quite sure. So we're looking at the words of Jesus, and we're flipping the script in that rather than us telling money what to do, we're asking money to pull up a chair and tell us what it would have us to do. So notice the words of Jesus in Luke 12 and 15. Jesus says to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And we've been learning this, right? That like the whole money thing, like money money can add value, meaning to our life, but it's not the meaning of life. We're we're embracing that. We get it. We understand that that money can add meaning to our life, but it's not the meaning of life, right? And uh, on that particular weekend, if you remember, I, uh, I challenged all of us. I said, hey, what are you doing with the extra that you have? And some of us look like, what do you mean extra? I, I don't think I have. I don't think I have extra. Uh, but just for illustration perspective, right? How awesome last weekend. L- last weekend, we shared the story. You've been watching the story uh, about Ukraine and Russia and the need that was there and how God opened up a door. And uh, I met uh, Ruslan um, and he was born in the old Soviet Union, and uh, we came together as a church, and uh, last week, Ruslan, he flew into Frankfurt, and I got a picture for you here on the back screen uh, of him. This is outside in Germany, and uh, some Germans that I've never met before, and, and we talked about what would it look like if, if we gave so that we could go into the Ukraine, we could take medical supplies, we could take some um, uh, food, and then on the journey back out of Ukraine, we could stuff that vehicle with humans and take them to to safety. Uh, That's a picture there of us loading up that that truck that that we were able to buy. And the reason we were able to, to buy that is collectively, as a church, and then remember, we invited some other churches to come alongside of us. And you can see down the screen, over $77,000 last weekend, one day, was given. There's extra. We all, we all have extra. And we just said out loud, what, what are we doing with the extra? That money, money, it can add meaning to our life, but it's not the meaning of Life. And then last week, right, we also taught that, that, that the moment you begin thinking that you own money, money would say, uh, actually, I own you, right? We're just managers, we're not owners. And it's a tension. Don't get me wrong, I fully understand, like, you have a job, and the paycheck is in your name, and the bank account is in your name, and it's a tension for us when Jesus says, hey, listen, God owns all things in the earth. I give you the ability to earn. I give you the ability to make money. I give you the ability to become rich, but we're the ones waking up and going to work, right? And it's, it's, it's a tension to go from, I'm not the owner of all this. I'm actually just manager. And so Jesus speaks to us. And this morning in Matthew chapter 6 and 21, he says, for where your treasure is, right? Whatever that treasure is, it could be a house, it could be a boat, it could be a bank account, it could be your 401k, whatever it is, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus, he's just, he's just teaching us. He's saying, and and we get it, right? That wherever my, my treasure is, whatever that thing is that, that I've, I've bought or is valuable to me, it, it, it is, it's important to me, right? Have you ever bought a, a new car or a newer car? It's amazing how when you buy that car, the newer car, ain't nobody eating in that car yet. You know what I'm talking about? And, and when you go to the mall or you go to the store, we're, we're not looking for that spot right out front. We're taking that spot all the way in the back because it's, it's a new car. 
It's a new possession, right? It, it's very, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that where your treasure is, that thing, right? You spend a lot of money. You're making those payments every month for that vehicle. That's where your heart, in other words, that our stuff, when we spend our money, a little bit of our heart is always following after it. Now, I'm sure the list could be longer than this, but to summarize how we spend our money, I think essentially there's five different places, ways in which we spend our money. Here, notice up on the big screen. Well, we spend it, right? And we're all pretty good at that. I get it. I like this. I want that. I, I spend it. Second, we repay debt. I spent my money on something or I misspent my money on something, right? And so I spend it there. Third, we pay taxes. Oh me, oh my. I hope you're paying your, your taxes. We, we save some, right, for a rainy day, and then we, we give some of it away. It, it makes sense. I'm sure there's all kinds of subcategories, but essentially, this is how we spend our money. Perhaps I could also say it in this way, right? We spend it on me, right? It kind of makes sense. I made the money. It belongs to me. I'm buying something for me. I repay the debt, right? The debt that I created because I wanted to buy this and I wanted this for me. Three, I, I, I pay my taxes and I'm hoping to get some kind of return, right? I'm paying in. Hopefully I'm going to benefit from some of these taxes and, and then I'm going to save a little bit of something. I'm hoping to go on this kind of trip, this kind of vacation. Maybe we're going to upgrade in this area. And then finally we get to this place where, okay, I want to give some of it to God. I want to give some of it to, to others. And it's kind of the general way of, of how we spend our, our money, right? And, and, and listen, it's not that there's something wrong with this. It's very understandable. For most of us, this is how you do it. This is the American way. This is the way that we've been, that we've been taught. Here's the tension. As Jesus comes, the Jesus that we love, the Jesus at Christmas time, right? Jesus at Easter time, he comes and he is the ultimate disruptor. Jesus comes and he challenges the way that people were living then and the way that we're living now. And the problem is, with our list of how we essentially spend our money, is God is last. And that becomes the tension. Jesus isn't shaming us. He's not mad at us. He's trying to teach us. Just like going to a doctor. A doctor isn't mad or shaming you. He looks at your conditions. He sees that your health is less than best. So he or she prescribes particular activities, some exercise, some nutrition. Maybe you got to adjust your nutrition plan somehow. It's not that the doctor is shaming you. The doctor wants you to experience life at its best. Same with Jesus. Jesus came not to condemn us, he came to save us. He came so that we would have a better life. And for many of us, we've totally embraced that. We get it. We've given Jesus our heart. You were in vacation Bible school, or you were in a youth group, or a Billy Graham crusade. Somewhere, someone said, do you want to invite Jesus into your heart? And he said, I want to trust Jesus with all of my heart. And so you said a sinner's prayer. And welcome to God's family. I'm so glad that you're part of God's family. Here's the tension. Many of us, would claim to have given Jesus our heart, to invite Jesus into our hearts, but we really struggle inviting him into our finances. That's what Jesus is speaking to in Matthew chapter six. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And let me let everybody know, hey, hey, Jesus isn't trying to get you to give all your money. Jesus is not even after our money. He's after our heart. It would be irresponsible to give all your money away because now somebody else has to come alongside and take care of you. That's, that, that's not what he's teaching at all. But know this, God always, when he walks into our life and he challenges us, he always gives us a remedy. He doesn't want us to feel stuck. He wants us to know there is a better way. That's the whole story of God is following Jesus always results in a better way of living emotionally, a better way of living mentally, a better way of living physically, a better way of living financially. Following Jesus is the better way. And so he says, here's the better way. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 6 and 33. 
Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, this list of things that you and I like, the, the things that Madison Avenue markets towards us and said, oh, your life would be better if you had this, if you had more of that, if you went here and you went there, all those other things that life is filled up Jesus says, here's the remedy. Normally when we spend, right, it's me, 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 me. Oh, then I'll give God and oh, I'll help others somehow. He comes as the ultimate disruptor to flip the script. It's challenging. I, 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 I totally get it. Um, it's, it's a pressure point, but he flips the script. He says, seek first God's kingdom, his ways, then all these other things. Things, in other words, reprioritize, reorder, restructure, rearrange, rethink. In other words, essentially let your spending look a little something like this. You flip it. You start with, I'm going to give it. I'm going to give to God. I'm going to give to others. Now I'm going to save some, right? It makes sense. You've worked hard all week long. And instead of paying Visa and MasterCard and the bank or anybody else, First, you what? You would save some of it. Of course, you got to pay your taxes. Everybody's got to pay their taxes. Then, then what have I overspent or spent? I wanted something now rather than waiting the later, so I've got to repay debt. Now I can spend it on me. Jesus is saying, this is the best way. Seek first his kingdom. Make Jesus the center. Make Jesus the point of your life. Then all this other stuff, all the other hopes and dreams that you're looking for in life, they'll be added to you. Now, here's the tension. I get it. I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm so with you. We're not convinced that this is the best way to live. We're, we're, we're convinced that, listen, I need to spend it on me. If I had this, if I had that, if I went there, if I moved over here, that somehow if I spent this on me, if I had more, I would feel better than I could show up and be better we got to ask ourselves, how is that really working for us when there's so much dissatisfaction? Maybe it's time to listen. If money talked, money would say out loud, listen, your affection, in other words, the direction in which you send your money is your affection. It reveals when you and I deploy our money in this direction, it reveals, it says out loud, this is what's most important. This is what you want. And what Jesus says, the best way to live, all the goals, all the dreams, all the hopes, all the satisfaction is to give first, save second, and live on the rest. If money talked, it would say, my direction reveals your affection. And Jesus gives us a real life story in Luke chapter 12. He doesn't want us to be confused. He wants us to understand that where your treasure is, your heart is also. And he tells the story of a young man. Although this story is 2,000 years old, it might as well be from the front page of any financial magazine today. Here's what he says in verse 16. And he, that's Jesus, tells them this parable, this story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. In other words, in our language today, you have your house, and last year Zillow said your house was worth 250000 Hey, good news. Zillow says now your house is worth 500000 Problem is, you can't. If you sold your house now, you got to go buy something else that's expensive, right? But the good news is the economy is up. The perception is I'm making me some money. That was happening here as well. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thinks to himself, she thinks to herself, hmm, what shall I do? I've got no place to store all my shoes. I've got no place to store my extra boats and my RVs and my four wheel. What, what will I do? Ah, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus and grain. And then I'll say to myself, 
Then I'll say to myself, you see it? (laughs) You got plenty. Look at your 401k. Have you seen it lately? That stock market's going good. I got me some money laid up for many years. Take life easy. Chill. Drink. Eat. Cruise. Do whatever you want to do. Be merry. It's the American way. This is what we're all living for, right? Is to make more money so we can go spend more money. It's how we've been trained. But then notice what Jesus says next. He says to him, You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Hey, we didn't go to bed in Ocala, Florida on Friday night believing that tornadoes were going to rip through our city. But they did. You don't get in your car and drive down the street and think to yourself, oh, somebody might cross that double yellow line and crash into my car and I die, but people do. Life and I don't, I'm not saying this to scare anybody. We know that it's true. It'll be on the evening news tonight. Life is brief. It's here for but a moment. And then it vanishes away. And what Jesus, what money would pull up a chair and say, my direction, the direction in which you send your money, the direction in which you spend your money, it reveals what's most important. And Jesus is just trying to help us understand this is the best way to live. Money is a tool that can add meaning to your life. So here's some questions. To what ends do you want your life to be a means? It's a fair question. To what ends? My life is for, and you fill in the blank. If money's a tool, and we have money, to what end do you want your life to be a means? God, God's not asking for everything. Jesus steps in with a remedy, and he says, here's how you do it. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. He's saying to us that when you and I step out into our everyday lives and just put him first, make Jesus the center, make Jesus the point, life will be experienced at its best. Here's another question. What do you want people to celebrate about you when you're gone? When your family calls me, it says, Hey, Mark, can you come by the house? Has passed away. Would you officiate the celebration of life? And, and I show up to your home, and I sit at your kitchen table with your family, and they start telling stories, and they show me pictures. What do you want your life to be celebrated? How do you want people to think? And you realize the decisions you and I make today are writing the story for that day. Oh, my dad, he was the greatest consumer. Anything he ever saw, he bought for himself. (laughs) Let me tell you something about my mom. She's the greatest contributor. Boy, she leaned in. Anytime there was a need, and sometimes the need was just to sit with somebody. My mom was never too busy. Boy, you could call him, and one thing about that person, my uncle, he'd pick up the phone. He'd talk to you. He'd pray. You and I are making decisions. Jesus says that that your treasure, where your treasure is, there is your affection. If you and I really want to change our hearts, if we really want to begin to rewrite a legacy, the way we do that is not trying to behave better, act better. The way we do that is change the direction of our money. 
Start following what Jesus says, seeking him first, making God first, making God first place in our lives. And you say, okay, Mark, how do I do that? Let me, let me show you how you did do that, okay? Last weekend. The best way to give is to give from a grateful heart and a broken heart. That, that you, you and I, when we, when we give from a grateful heart and a broken heart, I'm telling you, we are, we are generous people. It's the best way to give. Last weekend, think about it. People, together, we, we gave $51,000 that, that, that we had. We leaned into that space. And I think we gave one from a grateful heart. Hey, it's not lost on me. America's got issues. We got problems. But just right now, pinch yourself. <laughs> you were born in the United States of America. You hit the lottery. We're not in the Ukraine. We're not in Russia, I'm not in China, I'm not in Taiwan, I'm not in uh, Africa, I'm, I'm in the United States. And there was something inside of us, we're just, we're just grateful. Yes, we got issues, and yes, we're frustrated in politics and all the other kind of stuff that's happening in the world, but we're grateful. And then secondly, we gave from a broken heart. We are broken. The imagery of, of a man or a woman and their family and they're fleeing everything, right? Everything. They left their house that they paid for. They left their cars that they paid for. Their bank accounts, everything. And now they're just trying to get their kids to a safe place. The best place to give. Look across our community. Look and see where are there things that I'm grateful for and I'm brokenhearted for and lean in that space and be generous. In other words, Jesus is teaching us, give first, save second, and live on the rest. And I realize there's, there's a tension. We reverse that order. Because we're, we're convinced if I would spend it, then I would just feel better. I would, be, I would be happier. Look at, if I just had those shoes, if I just had that house, if I just had that car, if I just had this, I would feel better. And to some degree, it works. It's sort of like sugar. It gets in your blood system, and you just feel better. You just bought that. You look in the mirror, and you say, oh, oh baby, I look good. You're driving down the road. You're like, oh, my goodness, I'm like this. You, you feel better about it. I get it. But you know it wears off. Jesus walks into our life and teaches us a better way. If money talked, money would say, give first, save second, and live on the rest. So can I give you a few tools? This is the last of our series on this. I'm gonna bring a whole different message next weekend, but I, I wanna at least put some tools in your hands that you can take with you and apply this week, all right? So number one, Look at this little outline that's up on the big screen. I call this the my give, save, live commitment. Now this is between you and God. You've got to decide, right, that I want to give and then you fill in the blank. I, I, I don't know. You're going to give from a grateful heart and give from a broken heart. I want people, I can tell you, I am incredibly grateful. What motivates me? I am grateful on an island called Okinawa, Japan. I met Jesus Christ. I am forever grateful, and I am brokenhearted to think that there are men and women, because I actually, this might be lost on you, it's not lost on me. I actually believe that men and women who die without Jesus miss heaven and go to a real place called hell for all of eternity, and that breaks my heart, because I know the greatest party that there'll ever be will be in heaven. I mean, it will be phenomenal. It will be awesome. And I want everybody, I'm grateful that a guy named Mark, Jesus met in Okinawa, Japan. And so for me, I want to lean in and leverage my life, my time, my cash, my stuff for people. But you've got to decide what you want to give. That's not, that's not for me to decide. You, as a Christ follower, you decide. Hey, following Jesus is not a team sport. Oh, we're unified as the church, but you're following Jesus. You don't follow Jesus through your mima or your papa. You don't follow Jesus through your spouse. You don't follow Jesus through your parents or through your kids or through a pastor or a priest or a rabbi. And when you take your last breath on earth, the Bible teaches us the first conversation you'll have on the other side of heaven will not be with your spouse, will not be with your parents, or your dog, or your cat, or your gerbil that passed away, your first conversation will be with Jesus. You're going to have an up-close, personal conversation with Jesus. You've got to decide how you want 
to give. Second is I want to save. It makes no sense to work as hard as you do and to write all those checks to the bank. Sorry to my bankers in the house, right? To give it to Visa and MasterCard and everything else. You did the work. Save some of it for you. But you gotta be disciplined. You gotta say no to some stuff in the short term so you can say yes to other things that you might want in the long term. But decide, what, what, what is that, right? Now you have a number that you can live on. That's the pressure. Because you look at it and say, wait a second, there's no way. Oh my goodness. Are you asking me to live on 50%, 60%, 70%? And you're like, but Mark, we're already living on 120%. A little nervous laughter in the house on that one. Wrong direction, right? But this, this is a tool in your small groups, talk about it this week. I will send this picture to you in tomorrow's recap. Break it down as a family. Look at it. Remember, we're spying on our money. What does your money say? Not what you think, not what you feel, but go to the empirical data and look. We're spying on. How am I giving? How am I saving? And now what are we actually spending on? Let me give you, can I give you a second tool? Here up on the screen is this. Is the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University and a debt payoff calculator. Now, tomorrow when you get your recap, I'll actually have a link. You can click on that and you'll go right to the site. When it comes to the FPU, Financial Peace University, back in the day, we used to have to host it on the campus. Someone had to teach it. You had to sign up and be at, at the class every Tuesday at seven or Wednesday at four, whatever it was. Now you can actually register online and do all of FPU, distance learning, so to speak, online at your own pace and your own schedule. Really learning financial habits. And then this debt payoff calculator, it's a cool tool because you plug in your debts and then it begins to look at, okay, if I applied this much, how much would I pay off and how much time? And then how can I roll over this much in? It's really a cool tool. You can Google that and actually look at it today. Tomorrow, I will send you uh, the actual, actual links. And then finally, as just a summary, and again, this will be in tomorrow's recap. But we've been saying, right, if money talked, money would say, I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. So you and I need to rethink through some of our assumptions about money. Money might actually be hurting us and not helping us. You gotta rethink it. You gotta reprioritize it. You gotta wrestle with the words of Jesus. Jesus wants you and I to have our best life. We've given Jesus our heart. Doesn't it make sense that we would give Jesus our finances? You know, there, there are a lot of things that seem to be ridiculous in the world. There are a lot of people, words, behaviors that seem irrational. Would you agree? I've had conversations. I mean, people would say, it's irrational what Putin's doing. Why would he even think about doing it? It makes no sense. Why would someone want to do all that? I get it. That's irrational. Some people, and I realize when it comes to, you know, politics and things, people somehow think we should never talk about it, but it's a part of our life. Some people would say it was, it was totally irrational. Like, man, I loved everything about President Trump's policies, but it was so irrational the way that he would tweet or what he would say about people. Why would somebody who's such a great leader, why would, I, I, I get it, seems irrational to me. I, I get it. Some people would say, hey, it's irrational. We got, you know, President Biden. It kind of wonders who's in control. Is he really the president or not the president or the vice? I, I get, there's all kinds of things. Kanye West. <laughs> right? I mean, I get it. There's like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Right? It just seems, but here. As Christ followers, now if you're not a Christ follower yet, this probably doesn't mean much to you. But all those examples pale in comparison to those of us who are Christ followers. Check it out. Like as Christ followers, you know what we believe? We believe that like really God sent his son Jesus 
and she was bo- and he was born of a virgin. Like we believe that. We believe he walked and he talked and he, he, he was tempted like we've been tempted, but he never, ever sinned. We believe that Jesus went to the cross. He felt all the pain, the physical pain, the nerve endings, all of the betrayal, the loneliness as his own father. As he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We believe this stuff. We believe that he actually gave up his life. He took his last breath, and he died, and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And we've invited Jesus into our hearts to save us so that when we die, we go to heaven. Are you with me? Right? But you know what's irrational? We've invited Jesus to save us and to take us to heaven, but we haven't invited him into our finances. That's the most irrational behavior in the galaxy. Something so big as where we're going to go when we die. We trust him. Something as everyday, practical, as how we will interact with our money, we don't. That's what, can I have that screen back, gang? The summary? That's, that's what I'm trying to get you to figure out. Is we got to rethink the assumptions. we got to figure out where that money that you and I are managing for God. It's a tension. I get it. I'm with you. To begin to retrain your mind. I'm not the owner. I'm the manager. Everything that I have belongs to him. We say our lives belong to him. We say our souls belong to him. But we also rethink and say that our money, our time, our skills belong to him. My direction reveals your ultimate affection. Make God and others your priority. Let's not just tip them. And let's not just kind of say, okay, what's the, what's the minimum that I got to do? And I'm going to check that box off. Listen, following after Jesus, we are all in. Because what you choose to do with me, money would say, speaks volumes about who and whose you are. Leveraging your money for something meaningful. If money would talk. I can tell you this. The most important thing money would say it has really nothing to do with finances money would even be wise enough and I realize it's an inanimate object but metaphorically money would say the most important decision you'll ever make is to trust Jesus to make a decision that you can't fix your life and that because we've all sinned we've missed out on the peace that so many of us want And all that's found in a relationship with Jesus. And if you've never begun a relationship with Jesus, in a moment when we close in prayer, I'd love to invite you to start. Not asking you to become a theologian, not asking you to become a partner at Church of Hope. I'm just saying, why not today lean into that space? Online. Just pray, hey God, it's me. I can't fix me. And so I'm inviting you today into my life to save me to rescue me. You died on that cross to pay the penalty of my sins. And I choose today to believe you, to invite you into my life. And all who are praying that prayer, welcome to God's family. I'd love to help you grow in knowing Jesus. You can use the card at your chair. Check that box and say, hey, listen, today I I became a follower of Jesus. And I hope you hear my heart. It's so much more than checking a box. That's why I want to connect with you. I want to help you keep growing. Or in the privacy of your own phone, you can just text the word HOPE IN OCALA to 63566, and we'll reach the word today, whichever word they tell you on the screen. Today to 63566, and we'll follow up. Hey, you've been sitting for a while. Why don't you stand with me? Stretch your legs. If you let me, I'd like to pray over you. Uh, Next week, starting a brand new message. 
Uh, it's going to be a standalone message, and I think you're going to be encouraged by it. I know it, it's been encouraging me in my study. I want to uh, pray over us. Uh, next week, if you've not signed up for Growth Track and really helping you experience life at its best, you can get registered. All the information is on the screen. Love to have you be a part of Growth Track. I get to spend uh, time with you. I'll be teaching, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you at, at Growth Track. Um, I'm going to pray over us. Let me just also say that uh, over the years, we've known we've had some issues with our sound system. It hasn't always been as clear, and sometimes uh, it's just loud, and there's a difference between having a nice, clear, full sound in the room compared to just loud. That's over the years, right? You can see the different sound panels we've put in. We've done a lot of different things as we've tried to stay focused missionally on what happens off this campus um, and all the things happening in the world. But we finally got to the point, the sound system that was here uh, was here when we, when we moved in and we were renters, we bought this sound system from Church at the Springs. And then they moved over to their new facility. So for 14 years, this has been the sound system. Um, we are installing this week a new uh, sound system uh, that we've saved up for, absolutely. And... Um, but we, when I get done praying, we could use some of your all's help. We got to pick these chairs up so they can get the lifts and driving around and putting the new speakers and all the kind of stuff that those people do that I know nothing about. So, but we would definitely appreciate your willingness to stay and help us uh, pick up those chairs. Father in heaven, it has been a great day. We have gathered together. We've sang these songs of declaration of you being our savior. Jesus, you conquered the grave and gave us hope and peace, and we praise you. Heavenly Father, you have given us new life as adopted sons and daughters in your family. And Holy Spirit, you live in us and you guide us and direct us, and your word shows us how to live a better way, and so we praise you. We thank you for what's been given for the people of Ukraine and we ask that you watch over Ruslan as you guide him and direct him. Set your angels watch care over him. Keep the enemy from identifying him. Take him to the right city to deliver food and deliver medical supplies and for the families to get inside that truck and be transported to safety. For the men and women in our community who were impacted by this tornado, show us how to come alongside and to love them and to pray for them, but yes, to be hands and to be feet and to be finances to help them discover hope in your son, Jesus. Bless these men and women. In many ways, God, they are following your way. Their generosity week after week and their generosity for the people of Ukraine is a declaration of how they've chosen to make you the center and make you the point of their life. May they walk in favor. May they be filled with your presence, that deep abiding assurance that you love them and that you are in them and you are with them and you are for them. Encourage them when discouragement comes against them. And God, open our eyes and our hearts to see the world around us to leverage our lives and our time and our cash so that it will be said through us, Ocala and Marion County is the hardest place in the world to go to hell from. May the fragrance and the aroma of your salvation be a part of every conversation we have this week. Oh, how I love you and love these people. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Peace.